Thanks for joining me here today for my defense talk uh, related to expanding geographic access to fertility care, where I took a statistical and multi-objective optimization approach to figure out how best to site new fertility clinics around the country. This uh, problem is particularly important to me and my wife. We, uh, we had our children through uh, in vitro fertilization. Yeah. We leveraged the current existing infrastructure for fertility care in the US and uh, and diving into that problem, it was interesting to find out all the ways that it could be better in the US. So that was the focus of this dissertation. Hold on. There we go. So just to give you an outline of my presentation, I'm going to give you a broad introduction of the problem and has how is it how it is today and focus on SA1, which was just characterizing where fertility clinics are in the United States. Uh, I focused on impact of satellite clinics. So satellite clinics are the, uh, a subset of fertility clinics that haven't really been studied. And then I explored racial and equity, racial equity and geographic access to care. And then next I moved into predictive spatial modeling of assisted reproductive technology demand. Uh, and fertility clinic presence. So I modeled two things. One was just demand for ART, and the other was whether or not there was a clinic in a given geographic area. And then I moved into SA3, which is the optimization portion where I, I looked at how using optimization do you find new locations for new clinics. And I give you a, a, a summary of the limitations of my study and then uh, conclude. So just to introduce you to the problem, one in eight couples in the U.S. have trouble getting pregnant or sustaining a pregnancy. That's uh, about 12, 13 percent. So it's a pretty common problem, but it's not terribly well talked about. It's sort of a taboo topic. And so that that large number of, of couples who actually have trouble is, is sort of the silent, silent uh, large fraction of the of the country. Um, <clears throat> there is good treatment for it, though. There's assisted reproductive technology, which includes in vitro fertilization, which many people know about. Uh, but generally, those terms are used interchangeably. So, because uh, the most common form of ART is IVF. But I'll use them in both ways in this, this uh, talk. Uh, so, there's an estimate of about 25% of demand for ART in the US uh, based on international standards of, of utilization of, of ART. And so, and that, is, that international standard is about 1,500 cycles per million population per year. So, when you do the math, we do about a quarter of what. Uh, peer, peer countries in, say, Northwest Europe, uh, Australia, Israel, all of those countries are doing about 75% more than we are per capita. Then uh, there was a 2017 study that estimated uh, the ge geographic access to care, and that found that about 30% of women don't even live in an area with a clinic. And so, so that was sort of the uh, motivation for this this work was the concept that well maybe if you could improve geographic access to care you could then improve actual utilization there are a number of barriers of course to care but the focus of, of this work is that geographic component so back to the satellite clinic so so the satellite clinics are often cited as a tool to expanding geographic access to care but they've never really been studied their locations are not actually tracked by the CDC and they're really only, the only organization that tracks satellite clinics is something called the Society for Assistive Reproductive Technologies. So SART, uh, they, they track satellite clinics, but only 80% of clinics of ART practices are actually in SART. And so if you wanted to do a study on SART practice, on SART clinics, you wouldn't get a comprehensive look because you'd be missing 20%. And then the CDC, if you did studies on, on their practices, you'd only get the embryology labs. Because the CDC only tracks those based on a law that was passed in the 90s that essentially said that all embryology labs had to report their performance every year to the CDC. So then the role of ART satellite clinics uh, has never really been studied with respect to their geographic access. And no studies in the literature are found have investigated racial or ethnic disparities in access to ART. So the methods to, to address this, first I had to find all of the clinics. So this was... This involved Googling every single CDC, every single practice that was listed in the CDC's success rates data set. So every practice that, that contributes there, that reports to the CDC, I went through every single one of those systematically. I inserted into a web form that I made using ArcGIS's Survey123 infrastructure. 
uh, the specific details of each practice, where they were located, what services were offered. This is just the top of the, foot, the web form. And then, and then I used what are called CBSAs. So CBSAs are core-based statistical areas. They're made by the Census Bureau, and they essentially are areas that people commute within a sort of metropolitan or micropolitan area. So it, it covers most of the population, well, 96% of the female reproductive age population. So most people, by and large, are in these CBSAs. And so they form a really good way to approximate geographic access, because you can just say, OK, is there a clinic in this CBSA? If there is, we can then assume that everyone has access to that, to that clinic. So the next uh, method I used was logistic regression to model the presence of satellite clinics in a CBSA or main or, main or satellite clinics. And then I looked at, uh, I used an independent t-test to look at state IVF insurance mandates. So that brings up another uh, detail where each state in the country has decided whether or not to pass uh, mandates for their insurers to cover uh, IVF and ART. And some states have and some states haven't. It's about maybe 15 at this point. When I started this work, it was maybe, I think, 11. So it's, there's recently been a lot of movement on IVF insurance mandates. And there's a question as to whether or not they affect more or, or less clinics in a state. So this is the culmination of that, all the, the, the web searching, where I, I went through and Googled every single clinic. All the pink dots are satellite clinics, and all the blue dots are, or the blue stars are main clinics. So the main clinics have embryology labs. The uh, satellite clinics do not have embryology labs, but they do serve an important role of, of doing the monitoring that's required for an IVF cycle. So IVF cycles don't just happen, you don't just show up and do IVF in one day. You have to go back over months, uh, and each month requires probably 15 visits to the clinic for monitoring so that the stimulation uh, with hormones is done properly and safely. Uh, and so essentially, this is where all the clinics were found. I even made a tool that the, the QR code is. So if anyone wants to take a picture with their phone, there's a link I can send you as well. But essentially, you can go in and you can put in your address and it will tell you the closest clinic. And then you can even find all the details that I found from the, uh, the search. So then rolling those all up into uh, the numbers, the geospatial analysis found, or geospatial analysis of all those clinics, uh, essentially there were 441 unique practices that I found. Uh, 469 main clinics and 583 satellite clinics. And the question then comes up of, you know, how many women have access to care? How many women live in a CBSA with a main or a satellite clinic? And essentially there's 72% that have access to a main clinic and 8% that have access to only a satellite clinic. And then 13 million women, 20% of the population who have no access to ART. And now these are these are women that are not necessarily in, in rural areas, but they're not uh, they're not necessarily. I mean, they're living in a town or a metropolitan or micropolitan area, so it's still a good portion of the population does not have geographic access based on the CBSA method. So where did those numbers come from? They came from basically this map, where these are all the CBSAs in the country, and anywhere that's blue is one that has an, at least one main clinic, and anywhere that's pink is anywhere that has no main clinic, but has at least one satellite clinic. So all the pink areas are the places where 8% of the reproductive age population live. And all the blue places are where that 70%, uh, I believe it's 70% of the population uh, live that have access to a main clinic. So it's definitely better to live in an area with a main clinic because satellite clinics are not open uh, on weekends generally. And they you don't actually go to the satellite clinic for your, uh, for your retrieval of of eggs or your uh, or your transfer of embryos, and so you you do have to travel to these main clinics, but ideally you can you can only travel there occasionally if it's far away, and instead you can travel to the satellite clinics. So then the question is how back to the racial and ethnic access. So essentially, I I did the same thing with CBSAs, but counted the population by race according to the Census Bureau. And the Census Bureau has a bunch of definitions for, for different races. Essentially, there's you know, white alone, black, or African American alone, American Indian, Asian, Native, and Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islanders alone, some other race, two or more races. And then the ethnic categories are not Hispanic or, not Hispanic or Latino, and Hispanic or Latino. 
and then I said, you know, same exact thing as before, you know, is there a main clinic in areas and then and tallied up the, the number of white people with access, black people with access, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can see these dotted lines at the top are essentially, this is your access to satellite clinics. And so some, some racial categories have better, some have worse. Um, and then the, the main clinics is the blue line. And again, some have better or worse, and then the purple sort of combined. And essentially what you find is that American Indians and Alaska Natives are, are severely underserved by, by fertility clinics in the US compared to the rest. So that's, that's right here. There are about 17% less utilization, and not utilization, less access geographically using the CBSA method. And then not Hispanic or, not Hispanic or Latino is also underserved, but just by 1%. So then the next question that we come to is, is are the satellite clinics being placed in a way that is expanding geographic access to care or are they being placed for the benefit of the practices to compete for patients? That's the, the, another outstanding question. Uh, and essentially when you do some analysis on that, you find that uh, practices are locating their satellite clinics about 42 minutes away from their main clinic. So they're, they're, they're located in their satellite clinics a good ways away from their main clinic. But then relative to another practice's main clinic, they're very close. So the median time to any practice's main clinic was 16 minutes, as opposed to uh, the 42 minutes to uh, their own practice. Uh, and so you can see that, you know, with this snapshot of the Baltimore DC area, where you have, you know, in the, in the Northwest Washington area, you have three main clinics and then a satellite clinic that just get popped right in the middle of them. That, that satellite clinic is clearly there to provide some sort of competition for these other practices because no one needs that to be there in order to have geographic access to care. I mean, potentially they offer different, you know, different services or different, you know, uh, way of doing ART, things of that nature. But at the same time, from a, from a purely access standpoint, uh, this is not increasing access. And so that's generally what was, what was the finding is that most satellite clinics, 85% so of satellite clinics are located closer to the main clinic of another practice than to their own main clinic. And so they're generally, the conclusion is that they're generally being placed to, for competition purposes. So then back, coming back to the state IVF insurance mandates. So most health plans in the US do not cover ART. It's maybe a quarter based on some surveys. Um, and so there's a question of, do the state IDF insurance mandates have an impact on the industry? And are, and are they resulting in more, a better geographic access in certain states over others? And the way that I, I assessed that was I calculated the number of ART clinics per million women in each state and then I grouped states based on if they had an IVF insurance mandate before 2018, because the data I have on this is from 2018, so that made sense. And these are the different states that had mandates before 2018. And then I did an independent t-test on those two groups, and essentially there were six more satellite clinics per million women on average in IVF mandate states than in non-IVF mandate states. And that's at this level of significance is 0 0.04. So that's statistically significant at 0 0.05 level. And then, but for main clinics, there were more main clinics in, in, in IVF mandated states, but not more main clinics, or but not at the point of level, not, not at the levels, it's just significant, so point zero five. So then the next uh, approach I took was to look at population and median income. And I asked the question of, well, what's more important, the population or, or the wealth? Because most insurance does not cover IVF, and so most people have to pay out of pocket. So then there's a question of are clinics locating clinics in, in, a, in a way to serve people primarily or to, uh, to serve markets. And so when you do that modeling, it uh, showed that um, essentially population is three times more important for me than median income for main clinics, but only two times more important than median income for satellite clinics. And essentially this, this table here shows the, the betas for, for the logistic regression um, modeling. And so you can see the, the just the magnitude of the of these of these betas are much higher for main clinics versus uh, for, for the population versus median income. And then for satellite clinics, it's not much of a it's not as large of a difference. 
So then what, what then I did was as an engineer, I said, okay, well, it's great to have these models, but let's make some decisions with it to improve the process, to, to, to better the situation for geographic access. So the way I did that is I applied that logistic regression model you just saw to calculate the likelihood of a main clinic or a satellite clinic existing in a CVSA. And so these likelihoods are in, in this, this column and then this column, and that used just female population and female reproductive age population, which by the way is from ages 20 to 49, is generally the accepted age range, and then median income. And the CBSAs identified that do not have a clinic currently, but are likely to have a clinic, at least a main clinic, are located there. And it's pretty surprising that uh, a lot of these, especially stock in California, because it's right in the, that's in the San Francisco area. It's right near all these clinics that could easily just locate a satellite clinic there. But instead, people in Stockton, California have to travel upwards of an hour to a clinic outside of their CBSA in order to in order to get treatment. And then I did the same thing, but not with a predictive model, just based on numbers. So for the American Indian and Alaska Native population. And the reason why I focus on American Indians and Alaska Natives is that they're the only group, if you if you research in the literature and say, well, based on race and ethnicity, what groups underutilize ART? And the only group that both underutilizes ART and is underserved geographically is American Indians and Alaska Natives. And so that's why the decision was to simply prioritize on maximizing coverage of most American Indians and Alaska Natives. And so when you when you rank order all the CBSAs that do not have clinics currently based on their population, these are the locations that come up and you can, you can cover about a quarter of a million American Indians and Alaska Natives with only five clinics. <laughs> and you can, you can reach about 8% of their, of their total US population with just five clinics. So there's definitely some low hanging fruit for, for reducing those disparities. So coming back to the, the satellite, satellite clinic question, I wanted to bring up something called Hotelling's Law. So Hotelling's Law is this economic law from 1920s in which essentially two vendors will not locate, well not two vendors, but generally there's a steady state of where businesses will locate, for-profit businesses will locate in a way that they cluster, unduly is actually the term. So they will cluster rather than you know lo distribute in a socially optimal manner. And that's why you see you know, Burger Kings next to McDonald's, that's why you see hotels all grouped together. And essentially what we found with satellite clinics is that you also see that with ART satellite clinics. They're, they are clustering in a way that it seems to be, I mean, ART is a, is a for-profit industry. It's not a not-for-profit industry. The only not-for-profit players are the academic, academically affiliated, um, academically affiliated clinics, which like Johns Hopkins, for example, has an academically affiliated clinic up in Taos in Maryland. Um, so it's not operating for profit, but I'd say it's maybe 85% of 85% of the industry is for profit practices. And so they are located in a way consistent with, hot with hoteling's law. And that being said, satellite clinics are still valuable and they ex expand geographic access to 5.1 million women. So it's not to say that they're not useful. It's just most of the time they're not terribly useful for extending geographic access to care. They're more useful for expanding convenience uh, and having a, a satellite clinic five minutes away when you also have a main clinic 30 minutes away, essentially. And then the, the last point is that state IVF insurance mandates are likely influencing the establishment and continued operation of satellite clinics based on that t-test result. So then coming down to coming back to the American Indian and Alaska Natives, I researched this more and it's uh, there's a lot to get through with this. And so essentially the US government, you know, a long time ago kicked Native Americans off their land with the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and moved them out west to Indian reservations. Um, and then also the US government in the 70s, they, they provide free health care to Native Americans. But for some reason, there was a practice of without informed consent for sterilizing Native American women in the 70s. So that was that was a, another piece. And this is why I bring up uh, that the lack of ART for American Indians and Alaska Natives is potentially has human rights implications. It's not violations, but human rights implications that 
that the US government is failing to provide the latest treatments for ART in the context of that terrible history. Um, and so that, that brings us also to the, the very Supreme Court rulings over the years that have established the relationship between US government and Native American tribes as a guardian to ward. So it's, it's like they're wards of the state and their tribal matters are micromanaged. And so if the US government is not providing for them, the free market is not going to. Um, and so coming further down into this argument that I'm making, the UN made a declaration of human rights that essentially said that all men and women have the right to found a family. And then the WHO just recently in 2009, for the first time declared infertility a disease, which is remarkable because you know any other, you know, you have various systems in your body. You have, you know, you have your circulatory system, your, your skeletal system, your reproductive system. And for the first time, the reproductive system was declared a disease in 2009. <laughs> Um, and so then, as a result of that ruling, actually, the, uh, there's a human rights court, uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, that declared the banning of IVF in Costa Rica was a human rights violation. And as a result, now there's IVF in Costa Rica. Hmm. So there's, there's then, you know, the, the next step of this argument is that if the U.S. government's guardian ward arrangement is effectively stunting the ability for ART to be, to, to be on tribal lands, because they're not economically viable, and the, the IHS and the uh, Indian Health Service, and the Indian Health Service does not provide ART directly, which is, which is part of its, its uh, mandate is to provide the highest quality of care to, to Native Americans. Um, and there's also this, this thing called the patient referral, um, patient referral, I, I forget what this is term, but it's, the, the ability is for, Native Americans to seek care outside from a specialist. And that, um, I did a, a FOIA request actually for this, where I asked, you know, is infertility covered? Could someone, could a Native American simply go to these private clinics and have it be paid for through this PRC system? And the result I got was no, it's actually an excluded, um, excluded treatment actually altogether. So, so that is essentially is the argument I'm making is by the US government not providing it, we are, and the guardian ward relationship effectively preventing it. We are we're effectively stopping Native Americans from being able to have this level of treatment. So summarize essay one. Essentially, satellite clinics play a role in extending geographic access to care, but most clinics are located in proximity to a main clinic. There are promising locations that exist clinics, the logistic regression, and then there are also racial disparities in access to care. And then finally, there are human rights implications from the failure of the U.S. government's guardian to provide ART to Native Americans. So moving into SA2, so SA2, essentially ART healthcare practices are for-profit enterprises, like I said. So they're incentivized to locate in areas with high enough demand in order to get a high enough rate of return to attract investors. Now it costs a lot to open up a fertility clinic. It's $5 million to open up a main clinic and about $1.2, $1.5 million to open up a satellite clinic with the monitoring capabilities. Uh, but ART is a growing industry. So there are a lot of investors investing in it actually. And it's grown from 2 billion a year in 1992 to about $8 billion a year today. So it's, it's an area where understanding that demand is, is, would be helpful for driving the industry's investment. But how do you predict ART demand nationwide? So demand for healthcare services is typically estimated using just population. So you just say, okay, what's the fraction of the population that generally gets get sick with this disease, you know, how much population do I have? Let's just multiply those fractions by the population, and then I'll have a sense for the demand. Uh, but for, for ART, there's a number of non-infertility reasons for using ART, including egg or embryo banking, gestational carriers for single male or gay couples. And then also the literature contains a range of factors that are related to ART demand, including race, ethnicity, religion, economic, and environmental factors. So, the race and ethnicity, there's a number of studies that have found various uh, reductions in utilization from various racial groups. And so even though infertility is more common for older black or Hispanic women without college degrees, infertility, which is a reason for using ART, um, they, they are less actually likely to use ART, which is, is, is the, the hard part. It's they, they have more infertility, but less use of ART. 
initially African Americans delay care by about a year compared to their white counterparts, even in Illinois, which is a state that mandates insurance coverage for IVF. Yeah. And then the, the highest utilization is by Asian Pacific Islander women, and the lowest by American Indian and Alaskan natives. So this this you know it's point to clarify it's important to clarify that race and ethnicity have a number of confounders that are you know are contributing factors that race they're not necessarily uh, causes of lower ART utilization, but they, there are easy ways to detect lower utilization. So then going into religion, religion oftentimes comes up when, when I give talks on this. And essentially, you know, oftentimes there's a question, well, what about religion? I think that would, that would factor in hugely in all of this. But it doesn't seem like when you look at the, the literature that religion is actually playing a huge role. So religions are generally cautiously positive about ART. They celebrate its potential to, to treat infertility, but they're concerned about its implications on marriages and human embryos. Uh, Judaism is actually probably the only religion to fully embrace ART. So there's, there's this belief that the soul enters the embryo 40 days after conception based on, I think, Talmud 67. And there's also in the Bible, there's a, God's instructions to be fruitful and multiply. So there are clinics that actually, and this was started in Israel, but there are clinics that sort of are kosher, where they have a rabbi on, on site that has access, that has the keys to the embryo, that has the keys to the embryos <laughs> that are stored <laughs> and actually oversees all of the, the operations. Um, Islam uh, generally embraces ART, but not when donated eggs or sperm are used. And then the Roman Catholic Church is the only Christian faith, well, generally the only major religion in the US that opposes ART in all forms. So then there's the question of, well, that's doctrine, but how does that actually affect util utilization? And demand for ART. There was a 2013 Pew Research survey of a pretty large sample of the US, 4,000 adults, and 13% of Catholics, 13% of Protestants, and 9% of those religiously unaffiliated believe that IVF is morally wrong. So that, this is really interesting because being, I guess, Catholic really seems to have no effect on, even though the doctrine is, is very strongly opposing ART, when you actually survey Americans, they don't seem to, it doesn't really affect their, their beliefs towards ART. And then the religiously unaffiliated, you know, I guess that, that may, you know, it's not necessarily atheist, but, but that, that grouping um, doesn't seem to be that different from Protestant or Catholic as well. So it doesn't seem like religion is having that large of an impact. But if you, if you then ask, well, you know, what fraction of the population is actually religious at all? Um, essentially 29% of the population today is non-religious. So that's been increasing over the years. So then there's a question of, uh, will, how will that affect the ART industry? So secularization is associated with lower country level fertility rates. So countries that are more secular tend to have fewer children um, per, per capita. Um, but at the same time, highly religious women in the US have higher intended and actual fertility rates. And so if you have fewer religious people in the US, potentially you have fewer people who want to have children Therefore, fewer people would want to use ART, even though there would be, you know, zero qualms about, you know, the religious doctrine opposing it. So then coming into the economic uh, factors in ART utilization, the median cost of one cycle is about $25,000. Uh, the median cost of a successful outcome is about $61,000. Uh, and then this is about the one, the one cycle is about half of median income. So it's the economic factors are pretty large drivers unless there's some sort of subsidy through insurance or otherwise. Um, the average time spent on fertility care is pretty large uh, with 125 hours uh, by couples, 319 couples, they, 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 pulled, they surveyed them and asked them how much time did you spend on treatment? And the amount of time you would need to do these treatments seems to be a huge barrier as well, especially because FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act, there's one court ruling on it and uh, it was ironically uh, someone who got fired from a job at an insurance company um, who you know, claimed that her FMLA protection should protect her job because she took all this time off for, I for IVF. And then the judge ruled that she didn't have to take three days consecutive off work. So therefore she, the FMLA didn't apply and therefore she was rightfully, I guess, fired from her job. The 125 hours includes travel time? Yeah, that's travel time okay. because it's and all that stuff, yeah. 
So then back to the insurance coverage, it's generally not standard in the US. Diagnostic services are covered, but uh, the treatments themselves are generally not covered. The federal government basically does not offer it to either its employees or to uh, any of its beneficiaries of various social health programs, either Medicare or Medicaid. The only exception to that is uh, Medicaid in Utah. Medicaid recipients in Utah, uh, they qualify for ART, but only if they have a genetic disorder, not if they have infertility. Um, and then, so then the these fertility insurance coverage laws are great, and they seem to be making an impact on the industry in general, as well as utilization and access. Uh, but they don't apply to the case where an employer takes on the liability themselves. So if the employer self-insures versus going out to an insurance company and buying insurance, then they are completely exempt from the state IVF insurance mandates. And so where I work at APL, they do cover ART, but they don't cover it at the standard that's required for by Maryland law because APL self-insures. So, so then moving on to environmental factors in infertility, there's various factors that have been shown consistently to reduce fecundity. So fecundity is the ability to reproduce, whereas fertility is, is more of a, an effective number of children you have. Fecundity is your physical ability to have children. And various environmental factors have been shown to consistently reduce fecundity. And then there's various chemicals that have been associated uh, with both male and female reduced fecundity. And those include mercury, PDBEs, PCBs. And these are a lot of the common ones you hear in, in environmental health studies, dioxin and phthalates. Um, and so essentially the, the theory is that that my what I'm what I'm supposing what I'm what I'm proposing is that you need to cap factor in these environmental uh, variables in order to better capture demand if you're if you're predicting demand on a national scale. So then there's another couple a couple studies. Essentially, they closed power plants and then and, for, and then fertility spiked soon after they closed power plants as a function of distance to the power plant that they closed. Uh, PM 2.5 reduces rat sperm quality. Uh, essentially, there was another study that found for every 200 meters further away from a couple's residence from a major roadway, their increase is likely of, their, their likelihood of pregnancy by 3% for every 200 meters away. And this picture is Georgia Tech's campus with a residence hall right next to a 14 lane highway. <laughs> Just sort of as a, a demonstration of we are, you know, very much exposed to all the pollutants that are, you know, spewing out of cars. Um, and then also there's a reduction of ovarian reserve from diesel exhaust. Diesel exhaust is generally worse than, than gasoline exhaust. So coming into the ecological studies. So ecological studies are high level studies that are performed at the population level. That's why they're called ecological. And they allow you to direct public health strategies. And there's a single ecological study there to utilization. And so my contribution is to apply this large scale study um, of ART clinics and demand. So I rolled up demand. Uh, from every county in the U.S., and then I use the clinic presence from the systematic web search described in essay one, and then I use the county health rankings and roadmaps data set. This is a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation data set, where it essentially has great socioeconomic and environmental health uh, metrics for every single county in the United States, and then also the state IVF mandates from Resolve for both 2018 and then more recently uh, for the predictive model for current demand. So these are the different variables that, 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 that I were considered, essentially of state IVF insurance mandates, female population, and all these other different environmental factors. They include PM 2.5, exposure, drinking water violations, and then you have more social environmental factors like violent crime rate, income inequality. All these have been associated with poor health outcomes. And so the question was, well, which ones, you know, result in more or less ART demand and clinic presence? So the different methods I used to do these predictions were a range of machine learning algorithms. So not just one statistical method. I, I tested a range of, of statistical as well as machine learning methods that are uh, essentially uh, good representations of the different methods that are available today. So these are the different methods that I used. And the way you test it is essentially you, you initially hold out 20% of the data set for, for training, um, for, for testing at the end. And you use this training for data set, which is 80%. And then you do cross validation on that, where you use 90% of that 80% to predict the 10% held out. And you do that 10 times. 
but then you randomly resample which 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 bins are you know which. So you essentially get 30 estimates of performance from this 80% training data set. And then you use those, those estimates of performance to select your final model for final uh, validation. So for demand, essentially the negative binomial model was not the best, but this, I, that was the one that was selected to do the final modeling of the demand for ARG. Uh, but it was the simplest model that was easiest to explain. And you can see it's different performance. The X's are the average performance. Of predicted performance and then the, the lines are the median performance and you have different ranges of 75th and 25th percentile these box plots and so it was selected generally because uh there's this i have this belief that if your model is and there's support in the literature for this if your model is unexplainable then you'll have less trust in your model and then people won't want to use your recommendations essentially so that's why i went with the negative binomial model because it, it does it is an explainable model and then coming into the clinic presence modeling, essentially uh, satellite clinics as well as main clinics were both uh, the best model for those was, was logistic regression, which was impressive because there's all these fancy machine learning models out there, but the, the old fashioned statistical models held their own. So then coming to the significant variables, essentially there, then there's the question of, is it more the environmental factors or more the socioeconomic factors that are playing a role? And generally the finding was that it was the socioeconomic factors that are playing more of a role for both demand and for clinic presence. There's some environmental factors in here like percent smoking and, uh, and HIV prevalence rate. But for the most part, the factors that were most important were the socioeconomic factors for both uh, demand as well as clinic presence. So then I, I made a prediction for the entire country where I predicted ART demand everywhere and I mapped it. And so everywhere there's a circle is essentially, it's more than 250 ART cycles. And then essentially you have these different, different circles everywhere. And this is largely where the clinics are located. And then this is where I use the statistical model to predict where there are ART counties, where just like I did with the CBSAs before, but with counties now, I predicted a satellite clinic or a main clinic. And then if there was not a clinic of that type, then I mapped it or, or you know, of either clinic type. And you generally find new clinics located. You, have, you do have Stockton, California again, but you generally have clinics located in less affluent suburbs, suburban areas of larger cities. And so one of those is like Prince George County and all the, all the counties surrounding it all have ART clinics, but PG County does not. So coming back to what I just got into before, essentially socioeconomic factors are the primary drivers of demand in my modeling. Uh, there is definitely a value of primary care. That was the sec, I believe is the first most important variable for picking ART demand, um, for identifying infertile patients and driving, driving them to clinics. And then also IDF mandates were found in all these models to be statistically significant. So those continue to come up as being important. As I mentioned before, essentially there's these neglected or less affluent counties near large cities. Uh, and then there are no new main clinics in the Northeast. The Northeast in the literature has been found to be relatively well served. And that was, that was found as, as well in this modeling. There is an interesting finding that these college towns, three of the college towns essentially are in, in rural areas and they don't have clinics, but they're predicted to have clinics according to these models. So in summarizing, I did all these machine learning models. I predicted demand as well as clinic presence and then found that there are these neglected less affluent counties as well as areas of opportunities in college towns. So then coming to the optimization portion of this, essentially there are limitations of essays one and two. Uh, CBSAs are potentially too large, counties are potentially too small. Uh, what if you just actually model driving times between population centers? And so that's what the optimization approach did was, was to use those driving times. Similar to the literature, uh, that has modeled uh, ART access actually with driving times. Both Nanjia et al. they did it with urology clinics as well as male factor. And then Garani et al. did a, a gravity model. But that comes to the approach that I took. There's a range of optimization methods in the literature. There's the P center problem, which locates these centrally located facilities that are 
that don't factor in population, the p median problem that minimizes the average distance or time a person travels, and then the maximal covering location problem, which is the one I use ultimately to do this optimization. So the maximum covering location problem, there's a depiction of it here uh, on the right. Essentially, the neat thing about it is you have this dis you have a, a, a standard travel time or distance, and it'll allow you to maximize the coverage of population as opposed to simply uh, reducing median. The, the P median would be a good one, but with the, in, the, in the context of so few people having access to care or so, so many people still needing access, it seemed more appropriate to, to increase access to care through MCLP. So the formulation itself, I won't go into the math too much, but essentially the demand of the population is in your objective function, or essentially your demand or your population is A of I, and Y of I is whether or not you have coverage or not. And then I use the population centers from the US Census Bureau um, for, for every county in the US, and then the driving times from ArcGIS business analyst. So then in order to, essentially, I took this multi-objective approach where I, I contrasted objective space versus decision space um, of essentially two or more objectives of covering demand or covering population. And essentially to, to find those different uh, non-inferior solutions along the Pareto frontier, you use, I used the constraint method. And then once I did that, these are the locations where I found optimal clinic for in black is the optimal clinics to cover demand, and green is the optimal locations to cover uh, population. And then uh, pink is all the locations with existing satellite clinics, and blue with existing main clinics. So then what I was saying before is there's this Pareto frontier where you have to give up one objective to make gains in the other. And so essentially, the demand, the best demand solutions over here, the best population solutions over here, and sort of visually, I selected this quote, knee in the curve. The knee in the curve is where you, you uh, have improvement. You, you sort of, there's diminishing returns where you have to give up a lot to get back to, to more population coverage. So essentially, when you choose this one, you can give up only 21 ART cycles in exchange for 11,000 more women to get covered. So this is the value of the multi-objective approach is it allows you to find essentially a more socially, socially beneficial solution uh, without, uh, without giving up much in terms of profit. <clears throat> if you map those across the US, the gold is your, your knee and the curve solution. Again, your black and green solutions from before. And then the last thing I did was I folded in those all the solutions from previous essays. So blue is all the CPSA solutions, red is all the county solutions. And you ask the question of, well, if all models are wrong and some are useful, what if you combine all those models together in a spatial spatial context, could you find areas of agreement? And then those are really good recommendations. And essentially, the area of agreement is in Northwest Missouri, Southwest Arkansas, between the, the CBSA statistical model and all of the optimization models. So if I were to choose one location to invest $5 million of the new clinic, I'd probably choose it right there. So coming back to the discussion, essentially what I propose is this novel approach of of uh, maximizing population covered versus maximizing demand covered. Usually demand and, and population are sort of analogs when they do analysis. And to use them, to, to model them separately and then contrast the coverage of, of both of them is what I argue is actually a novel approach that would allow for improved social, act, social performance of siting clinics or other things like food deserts. So grocery stores similar to ART clinics are also for profit. And in the US, you have this issue where people live in areas that you don't have access to a good grocery store because grocery stores are located in areas where they're you know, trying to maximize profit. So I think there's applications of this, this approach in, in other domains for sure. So to summarize, I use the maximal covering location problems to identify locations, to optimally locate clinics versus the statistical methods from before. And then I use multi-objective optimization to understand the trade-off between covering population and demand. I found that balanced solution that needed the curve, and then I overlaid all the solutions to, uh, on a map from SA1, 2, and 3, and found that concurrence in Northwest Arkansas, Southwest Missouri. So limitations of all this, the web search from chapter SA1, essentially publicly inf public information. CBSAs is an approximation of actual geographic access. You could live right outside of a CBSA and 
and not have access to a clinic, even though you're nearby. Um, essentially, uh, the predictors of demand and clinic presence are only for the, the county models and CBSA models. I only use characteristics of the counties themselves without factors from outside of them. Um, but then hopefully the optimization model made up for that. And then finally, the 60 minute driving time, you know, you assume you have 100% coverage out to that, you know, 60 minutes and then 0% coverage outside of it. And so that's another limitation of this approach, but that's, that's how the MCLP model model, how the MCLP model works. So to conclude, I created a new data set. 80% of reproductive age women have access to either main or satellite clinic. Most satellite clinics do not increase geographic access to care. Native Americans severely lack geographic access to ART. Then I modeled presence and demand of ART clinics, and then uh, found that population and socioeconomic factors tend to be more important than environmental factors. Again, state IVF insurance mandates are impactful. And then I optimized the location of new clinics to cover the largest population or demand, and then combined all the recommendations uh, with the statistical and optimization methods. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to put some pictures up of all the people who supported me along the way. Thanks so much for all of your, mm -hmm. your backing up for this big effort. Uh, and very friends and family. So thanks so much for your time. And I wanted to break now for questions. OK, thank you. So at this time, we'll um, uh, welcome uh, questions from the public, and then the committee will will get our shot at you uh, in, in private in a few minutes. So um, whether you, inside the let me first check inside the room. Any questions here? I, I had one that, but he answered it already, which was um, other applications of this novel. Uh, you do uh, treating uh, demand and. Uh, population as two different objectives. Uh, could you maybe mention any others that, that might come to mind? Um, I think food deserts are a really good one. Um, I can't think of, I mean, it's basically any any situation where your population, no, where your, your population and your demand are not the same and where there's a social utility of a for-profit clinic being located in an area. And so, um, they don't locate to maximize coverage. They locate to maximize profit. Um, but no, I can't think of others than other than food deserts. Um, I think grocery stores are these things that everyone needs, but you know, operate in a for-profit manner. But, but um, the assumption that demand and, and population uh, are the same uh, is is like sort of deviating from that assumption, I think is, is a very worthwhile. Right. I mean, there, there has been a move towards more, I think, for-profit uh, healthcare centers as well. And so uh, urgent care facilities might be a good good example okay. of that, yep. um, where they're locating for sure to, to maximize demand, to maximize profit. So that would probably be the best analog, especially in the healthcare domain. Um, I think uh, Megan's got her hand up. So Megan, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Sure. So, um, all, such cool work, Mike. Uh, congratulations. Um, I think my biggest question is, how are you going to share this? Like, I feel like it, it could be so useful to uh, to people who want to start up clinics. Which What's your plan for that? So, I uh, I have archived all of this. There's the particularly clinic finder as well, but. Um, I have a, a paper uh, under review right now in the health, in BMC Health Service Research. And so that's on the satellite clinic paper, as well as all the modeling I archived with the JHU um, library with the JHU data archive. So conceivably, you know, if the industry wanted to use all of this sort of free consulting work, they could, you know, download my Excel spreadsheet with the models and then, you know, have that prediction for, uh, for the likelihood of a clinic as well as demand for that area. And that would help inform their investment. Um, conceivably, they could also reach out to me, but. <laughs> um, well, but you might I, want to let them know that this is out there. I mean, you know, just having it somewhere, they might not even know it's there. And I would hate to see all your work go to waste. So, right. yeah. but I mean, I have, I have been in, you know, I have two collaborators, um, one who's a reproductive endocrinologist from the University of Washington. And then I've been in touch with various, uh, there's, there's people at Hopkins who are actually. Uh, high up in the community of like more on the medical side 
Um, and so they are they're familiar with this work as well. I'm not sure if they're interested in if they're on the side of the for profit, they're more the academic arm of ARG. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did go to a conference last fall and I talked to one clinic that actually has a mobile ART, so satellite clinic that can go around. And I, and I, I told them that I'd be interested in, in sharing my work with them so they could direct where to put that mobile clinic um, and they could try out the market in an area. Um, but that that's really been the extent. But um, I would say, you know, the best way to find it is through, hopefully I get published soon. And then the other is the, J, the JHU data archive. The other um, last thing I'll say is uh, you might want to share it with the Center for American Indian Health, um, especially your your conclusions oh, yeah. about Native Americans. Okay, all right, thanks a lot. So, is that uh, a non? Megan, is that a nonprofit or where's? Uh, it's uh, it's it's actually part of Hopkins. It's um yeah, uh, it, it's down here in East Baltimore, and um, I can I can introduce you if if you need an introduction. Yeah, that'd be great. It would definitely mm -hmm. be good. I mean, I think that's the next step for the Native American work is to is to publish something like that. And it'd be great to have collaborators within who, who are, you know, because I don't know much about the domain. I just, you know, did the ge ge geographic work. <laughs> maybe be a great pay, pay them a virtual visit and give a give a short talk. Maybe not the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the but you know that bottom line at the, the end of your first essay mm -hmm. is, is really important. Thanks, Megan. And uh, by the way, let's see, I, I don't see that Jerry's still there. I was gonna point out that um, th at the time that Art and uh, Jerry Cohen were here, we were uh, geography, environmental engineering. We've since merged with environmental health sciences and public health. Um, and uh, Professor Latshaw is an uh, example of a faculty member on the public health side whom uh, it, because of this merger, we've established uh, connections and uh, potential collaborations and these sorts of discussions. So it's been one of the one of the the, the benefits of the merger. Um, is there anybody else who has a, a question online or uh, or here? Um, if not, I would invite uh, everybody, and I will go down the hall and knock on doors to join us in something like um, uh, an hour, perhaps a little bit less for um, uh, refreshments, uh, food and of course champagne, uh, if all goes well, down on the first floor um, uh, patio at, at Ames Hall. Um, so I guess at this point, we'll um, excuse the public part of the audience and we'll close the doors. <laughs> and we'll start the private questioning. Okay. And thank you. And Art, you're all, and Jane, you're all, you're all okay with in terms of getting the, um, the champagne and things downstairs? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. We'll follow Sarah. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Owen. Sure thing. <laughs> so do you see the rest? We're not going to speak for yeah <laughs> uh, this is her from uh february what? no kidding that oh wow and that's her yeah yeah that's her. well that's that's amazing normally you see like ultrasound pictures this is your in vitro embryo so if you put a a framed picture and put it up on on the wall <laughs> yeah i think you could <laughs> we we had this for forest too but i don't think we could find it um, but let me uh Okay. I have a good friend who's going through IDF right now. It's it's this is like so much interesting context to the conversations that I'm having with this. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, 